work on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, so this is all introduction. Other questions so far? OK, good. How's it going, John? All right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, how are we going to show that the halting problem is really undecidable, that there's no way to do it? Well, here's a really bad way. I just get an infinite number of my friends, and I have them try every possible algorithm that might work. And when they all fail, I say, uh, well, they all failed, so there's no way to do it. And that's no good, because I'll need another infinite collection to check all the other algorithms. There's a lot of algorithms out there, and you can't just check them all. So we have to have some kind of a reasoning, some kind of an argument that says no matter what argument, no matter what algorithm we try, it will fail to decide this question. And this idea needs the big guns of, uh, of computational complexity, something called diagonalization. And I showed you this idea before in a simpler setting, and I'm going to show it to you again in a simpler setting, and then we're going to go back to this setting and use it. So take a minute. We're going to shift back to finite state machines for about 15 minutes, review this idea of diagonalization, bring it back up to this level, because the idea at this level will be just the same idea at the smaller level, but a little more subtle. All right, so get it at the basic level, and then the subtlety will be more clear. All right. Questions? Good? All right, so let's do this. Let's talk about finite state machines for a few minutes. You all know there's plenty of languages that are not acceptable by finite state machines. Here's one. 0 to the n, 1 to the n, right? We prove that this is not acceptable by any finite state machine, and we use some pumping lemma kind of proof to, to show it. OK. But there's another kind of proof you can use to show that there are things that are not acceptable by finite state machines. We could bring the big guns of diagonalization out. And that's what I want to do now. And before I do it, we're just going to bring the big guns of diagonalization out onto that barber puzzle to make sure everybody remembers it one more time. Last time. There's a barber in town, and the barber shaves every one in town but me. That's right. <laughs> Everyone in town who doesn't shave themselves. Seems like a completely reasonable thing to say. There's a barber in a town, and he shaves everyone in town who doesn't shave themselves. The barber lives in this town. There's only one town, one town in the whole universe. The barber sh lives in this town. He shaves everybody in town who doesn't shave themselves. So does the barber shave me? I don't know. <laughs> not doing a very good job if he was. <laughs> if I shave myself every morning, then the barber doesn't shave me. And if I don't shave myself, then I go to the barber. It makes complete sense. But now the difficult thing is, who does a barber go to? If the barber goes to himself, then he shaves himself. But he's only supposed to shave people who don't shave themselves. So he can't really shave himself, because he's only supposed to shave people who don't shave themselves. But if he doesn't shave himself, then he's supposed to go to the barber. Everybody in town who doesn't shave himself is supposed to get shaved by the barber. So if he shaves himself, he's not supposed to shave himself. And if he doesn't shave himself, he is supposed to shave himself. This little conundrum, this little strange paradox, as simple and stupid as it may seem, because you could just talk about this in a bar when you're drunk and kind of go, oh, yeah, well. But it's actually at the, it's at the cornerstone of this whole idea. So if you get this, then all this will just be the same idea again, flushed out in more mathematical terms. So let me stop for a second, make sure everybody understands this, this funny trick. Is there any way to fix this problem about the barber? Move the barber out of town. Move the barber out of town. Right, right. That's a really, really, really good idea. It's an excellent idea. Right, let's move the barber out of town. The barber lives in finite state machine land right now, and we get this funny contradiction. So let's move the barber out to Turing machine land. Here's our barber. He lives out here. And this barber shaves everybody in this town who doesn't shave himself. No contradiction at all. If you shave yourself in this town, then you don't go to the barber. If you don't shave yourself, you go to the barber. And when you go, you've got to go through the border and make your way out to the Turing machine land. Then you come back, and you're nice and cleanly shaved. But there's no issue about who does the, what, is the, what happens, does the barber shave himself or not? Yeah, he can shave himself, right? Because he doesn't live in town. This 
doesn't apply to him. And he doesn't have to shave. Either way, you can decide it any way you want. So you move the barber out of town. All right. Now let's shift over to this analogy with a picture of finite state machines and Turing machines. Instead of barbers shaving themselves, we'll have finite state machines that are accepting strings. Accepting strings is going to be like the shaving, and the barber or the people are going to be like the machines. Okay, that's the analogy. <coughs> all right, the first thing we need to think about is what's a finite state machine? You all know what they look like, something like this. I've done this before. One, one, zero, zero. So what's that one? That's a finite state machine that accepts all the binary strings with odd number of zeros. Okay, now, before we talk about all these machines that live in here and whether, you know, something's going to um, accept them or not, we need a way of encoding these machines as binary strings so we can send them as input into other finite state machines that might decide something about them. So we talked about this once, and there was a way we used to encode the string. I think we used, we started with zeros, and, and we counted how many states there were, right? So we had two states, that was two zeros. And then we made a little divider, and we started with the initial state, and we listed the state that it goes to on a zero, that was state number two. And then the state it goes to on a one, that was state number one. Right? And now we went over to the next state. The state it goes to on a zero is state one. The state it goes to on a one is state two. And then over here we put two ones to show that we're done and now we're going to list the final states and the final state is just a single double zero. So that funny little binary string represents this finite state machine. Now you could represent this finite state machine in a million other ways. This is just one way. There's one method of turning finite state machines into binary strings. There's lots of other methods. Okay, and if you buy this fine, and if not, just let's just say this string represents this finite state machine, regardless of how we came up with it. But now the point is that this finite state machine can start churning on itself. So does this one happen to accept itself or not? Does this person in town shave himself? Does this finite state machine living in finite state machine land accept itself? It doesn't, because this must have an even number of zeros. Okay. So this machine doesn't accept itself, but you could certainly imagine that plenty of other machines I'd write down on the board, when I converted them to their binary strings, they would accept themselves. So some machines in town accept themselves, and some machines in town do not accept themselves. The same way some people shave themselves and some people don't. Okay, questions so far? Could yeah, Teresa. Encoded in a different way, would it accept itself, and therefore doesn't everything depend on the encoding? It completely depends on the encoding. Right. It completely depends on who's the uh, shaving manufacturer in that town. If a different manufacturer walks in, then some people who used to shave themselves all the time actually stop shaving. What if there's a power failure in town? Now, everybody who used to shave themselves with an electric razor doesn't, and... I guess I could say, well, why do we keep going on in this proof that we don't talk about the encoding as like a deciding factor at one point? Well, you pick the encoding, and then it kind of divides people up into finite state machines that accept and don't accept. But it isn't anything... It, it, it's not a function of the language, it's a function of the actual encoding. Some finite state machines will accept themselves and some won't. And it depends how you encode the string. So there's no truth to it, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary whether they do or whether they don't. Is that what you're wondering about? Is it just arbitrary? It is, it's arbitrary whether they do or whether they don't. But it's consistently arbitrary. I mean, they, they will all either they will all either accept themselves or not accept themselves according to this one encoding scheme. You can't like encode each one differently because that wouldn't make any I sense. I guess if you're like, if we're doing proof, then we should have like a list over there of all these assumptions that we made. Like, well, encoding is decisive. And, and sort of what does that mean overall in the proof? I'm going to convince you that no matter how you do the encoding, as long as there's, it doesn't make any difference how you do the encoding. The proof will go on just the same way. As long as there's some way to turn the machine into binary string and then run it on itself. It won't matter how you do it. It'll still work the same way. Are there, are there other questions? Well, let's, let's move on, because we're, we're just about up to the, the point in this proof that, that it looks like this barber who shaves everyone in town that doesn't shave himself. Let's consider all the finite state machines. 